Do you have a minute to talk? Sure, what's up? Is everything okay? Yeah, totally. Well, I mean, kind of. I'm just curious about something. That book over there that you're always reading? Um, I've heard about it, but I just, I don't get it. What's so special about that old book? Oh, my Bible? Well, it just so happens to hold the greatest story ever told. Really? What story? Well, would you like me to tell you? I guess so. I mean, I know it's about Jesus and everything because I remember my parents taking me to church every Christmas when I was little. But I just don't understand it. Well, then let the story begin. The greatest love story of all time, the story of God's sacrifice. We start our story on the road into Jerusalem. Jesus has just arrived into the city where many people were waiting to see him. But Jesus needed a donkey to ride in on. So he asked a man to find him one. Yeah, is this Amazon? All right, cool. So I need a donkey. That's right, Colt. So uh, how soon can I get here? Three days. I don't have that kind of time. Listen, man, this donkey is for Jesus. All right, see you in five minutes. <laughs> oh, look. <laughs> hey, careful, man. This is North Face. Oh. Hey there. Uh, so tell me, how do you feel about coming to Jerusalem? Well, it's great. Finally, we have a hero who will vanquish our enemies for us. Um, I don't think that's what he's really here to do. Jesus performed miracles. He even declared himself to be the son of God. That's great, right? I mean, everyone must have loved him. Well, sadly, no. The Pharisees wanted Jesus dead because they didn't believe he was who he said he was. Really, they feared he would lose their power. So, what happened next? Well, the leaders ordered Jesus to be arrested. No! Friends, pray with me and keep watch for me while I pray. What time is it? Late o'clock. I'm getting a little... Then Jesus was arrested. Jesus, you are under arrest, claiming to be the Son of God and endangering the people. All right, let's go. Wait, what? He was arrested? Why didn't God save him? Why didn't he save himself? Well, it was all part of God's plan to save us. Jesus had to die so that we could be free of our sins, and Jesus knew it too. <laughs> all right. Then we had Barabbas versus Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Rome. Tonight, we are freeing one prisoner, Jesus or Barabbas. Who's Barabbas? Well, Barabbas was an old prisoner that Rome had had, and it was tradition that they would let one prisoner go every year. So Caesar really didn't, Je Caesar liked Jesus, and he wanted Jesus to stay. But the people really didn't like Jesus, so Caesar made a choice. Ahem, <clears throat> bring out Barabbas. <laughs> oh, sorry, guys, I was a little bit late. Those bodies don't drag themselves. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Barabbas, why do you think you need to be freed? I'm an honest and hard-working man. I spend about two hours every day doing my business. And um, what business would that be? Uh, human craftsmanship. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Um, Jesus, why do you think you should be free? Nothing? All right, then. All right, guys. Who wants to let Barabbas go? Yeah? We for Barabbas? All right. Who wants to let Jesus go? Me. 
Mm. I do. Yeah, well, sorry guys, you weren't loud enough. All right, Bravis, you're freed. just that can't be the end I, I mean Jesus was good I, I don't understand it's not the end what it it's not it's not what it's not the end of the story amen Isn't that wonderful you know we sometimes say well our young people are the future of the church well they're a vital part of the church right now uh, and and it is a training ground uh, for them for the leadership that they will provide in the future and it's wonderful to have them at all different ages to be such a key part of our church the dude abides the dude abides so says the 1998 coen brothers film the big lebowski which is about jeff the dude lebowski played by jeff bridges the ultimate Los Angeles slacker who goes to the grocery store in his bathrobe and drinks milk out of the carton while he's still at the store, who hangs out with his bowling buddies and smokes weed and is slouching his way to Gamora. He's like the roadrunner in that cartoon that he never bothers anyone. He's just trying to have some fun. But drama comes into the dude's life nonetheless when he is mistaken for somebody else. Did you know that this cult movie classic has led to a new religion? It's called Dudism. <laughs> Let me read you the description from their website. Just take it easy, mankind. Come join the slowest growing religion in the world, Dudism. An ancient philosophy that preaches non-preachiness, practices as little as possible, and above all, oh, lost my train of thought. Anyway, if you'd like to find peace on earth and goodwill, man, we'll help you get started right after we have a little nap. Dudism.com. The dude abides, but if you're looking for a little bit deeper, more meaningful, and with a better future type of abiding, then let's go to John 15. And please stand as you're able in the reading of God's gospel, John 15, verses 1 and following. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. 
My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. You know, when you read the Bible, you quickly realize that vines and vineyards play a huge role in the lives of the people there. In fact, in the ancient times, the vine was the key to life in many different ways, or at least it provided the products of life. According to Genesis 9:20, Noah planted the first vineyard and enjoyed its fruit. And vines provided both grapes and raisins in ancient times, which was their number one source of sugar in Israel. Wine, of course, is another staple that is provided by the vines. In fact, one of the statements about what a person needed to survive in the prophets in the early history of Israel was grain, oil, and wine. It's what made up the diet of the ordinary person, and meat and the milk products were an occasional thing, but it was based ultimately on those three things, grain, oil, and wine. Deuteronomy 20 tells the conditions where a young man does not have to muster with the army and be a part of a war, and it gives three things that can keep you out of war. One is if you've just married a new wife, you get to spend time with her first. Another is if you've just acquired a house, you get to have some time with the house. And the third one is if you've planted vineyards and you've not enjoyed the fruit. It was that important in their life. And you know that vines take years to cultivate before they start producing. And then when they do produce, the harvest season for grapes is very short. And you must work intensely to get everything in before it spoils. And so it was a key part of their life that was organized around the harvest of vines and vineyards. More than just a reality, vineyards became a symbol of the value of the people of God to God. Israel is often portrayed as the vineyard of God, and then that gets moved over to the church as the, the vineyard that God loves, that God cares for, that God protects, that God provides for. In fact, look at me with me at Psalm number 80, verses 8 through 11 that talk about that. Yes. You bought a vine, or you brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. It's talking about God planting the people like a vine in the promised land. Isaiah 5 is a famous passage about God dealing with the people as his vineyard. And Jesus, after he arrived in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, in his conflict with the leaders there, told a parable about vineyard husbandmen that refused to give the produce of the vineyard to the owner. About the owner sending people to collect it and then beating the people or even killing them until finally the owner sent the son, his own beloved son, to collect the produce and the wicked husbandman killed him as well. The leaders know that Jesus is telling this parable about them. That the vineyard is the people of God and they have been those that have taken its produce and misappropriated things and misused and led in the wrong direction until God sent his own son to them. And from that point on, we're told in Matthew 21, they sought to have an opportunity to kill him. They sought to eliminate Jesus. So Jesus, when he meets with his disciples at the Last Supper, says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower or the vine dresser. The Christian life flows from a relationship with Jesus. We are like branches on a vine that cannot have sustenance, that cannot live without that life flowing through the vine, through Jesus Christ, to a spiritual life depends upon abiding in Jesus. 
You know, it's, it's an incredible thing the way that a fetus develops in a mother's body. The umbilical cord is this connection between fetus and mom, between baby and mom. It has three blood vessels that go back and forth with blood between the mom and the baby. Now, the mom's blood and the baby's blood never mix, but they're able to exchange nutrients to the baby and remove waste products from the baby. And a fetus will not develop without that umbilical cord growing out of the placenta and to the implanted egg there, the egg that is growing there. Its life depends upon the umbilical cord working, flowing, not getting tangled up, not being removed. The Christian life is like that with Christ. We have to receive that spiritual enrichment, that nutrients, if you will, that life flowing blood from Christ, or we have no life whatsoever. Just as the, the branch has to receive it from the vine, just as the fetus receives it from the mother. Abiding in Christ brings life to us. But abiding in Christ brings other benefits as well. And Jesus mentions several there. In the passage that we looked at, first of all, he says, God hears us and God responds to our prayers. When we abide in Christ, we are connected to the God of the universe. And we are a part of God's family. And in a healthy family, there's communication. People speak to one another. They, they communicate. They share things. In a healthy family, there's no big secrets that are kept. There's opportunity and trust and ability to talk to one another and to connect and to nourish the relationship that's there. That's what prayer does in our lives. It's an opportunity to talk to God. It's an opportunity to listen to God. It's an opportunity to develop that relationship of intimacy and love and care with God. And Jesus said, if you abide in me, that connection with God is there and God hears and God responds to your prayer. Secondly, he says, if you abide in me, it brings joy. Your joy will be complete. There's a sense of knowing who you are of knowing what your future is, and it's a good future that God has planned, a sense of knowing what is required and what direction you need to go in, a sense of completeness and joy has this lasting, abiding aspect that it can be present even in the hard times. You know, we talk a lot about happiness and the pursuit of happiness. Joy is much better than happiness. Happiness comes and goes, and it feels good while it's here, but then it'll be absent. Joy is that underlying feeling of security, of abiding in the one who gives us life. It really is a byproduct of abiding in the love of God and knowing the incredible love of the one who sent his son to die for us. And then third, Jesus says, when you abide in me, you will bear fruit. Now, we just got through an earlier part of this year looking at the nine fruit of the Spirit Joy and peace and love and kindness and all those things that flow into our life through the Holy Spirit when we abide in God. He's talking about that. He's talking about God shaping our character to be more like Christ, forming us and giving us those virtues that make us love and lovable. But he's also talking about our witness, bearing fruit in the fact that we share with other people the hope we have in Jesus Christ. People see what, what's going on in our life, and they say, as in the, the, the skit, what causes this? Why do you do that? Why do you seem to have a focus, a togetherness, a peace, a joy in your life when you go through the same kind of struggles I do? It's that fruit that comes from being able to share the love of Christ and having people respond to that is a part of the fruit that comes from abiding in him. And then finally, he says, when we abide in him, when we obey his commandments, when the spirit gives us the strength to live the way that God calls us to, and we respond to that, then it glorifies God, and we get a blessing from that. 
we have the fruit of being the obedient children of God. It pleases God. It makes an impact in our life. It blesses others, and it blesses us. Jesus says that we must abide in him. And when we do so, the Father, the vine grower, the vine dresser, does all that's necessary to allow us to get better and better, to have more and more fruit, to bring out our best. See, a good vineyard owner prunes the fruit, cuts off the dead things as winter approaches so that the vines won't spend their nutrients on something that is not going anywhere. In the spring, he looks at the vine, and if there are growths that really don't seem to be much of a, of a growth that's going to last or is important, he prunes those back so that all the nutrients can go towards the successful branches so that they can produce more fruit. And that's what God does in our life. But you know, pruning is not always a pleasant experience to go through, is it? You know, all of us are capable of going astray. All of us are capable of getting on the wrong path. And we need God's Spirit to lead us back to the right path at times. We need God sometimes to close doors to get us to go through the right door. Sometimes we need to go through those difficult times in order to get our focus back on the right things because we can all get to the point where we major on the minors and minor on the majors, if you will, where we worry about things that aren't important, where we focus on things that are passing away, where we get lost in the details and don't get the most important things right. And God keeps us focused on the best. God keeps us focused and going on the right path. And it's not easy. Pruning is not fun. It's like those those tough conversations that we sometimes have with people that we don't want to hear something that they have to tell us, but those are often the ones that we need to listen to the most. I remember when I was going to seminary and I was working at the public library and I was having conflict with a woman that I was working with. She was my age. We were both early 20s, and my boss called me in one day and said, this needs to stop. It's affecting your work. It's disrupting things in the library. You need to focus on this and just stay away from each other. And I was embarrassed to get called on the carpet. I was embarrassed to have to listen to that, but it was exactly what I needed to hear. It was a part of that allowing me to do better by telling me what I needed to hear. Sometimes that pruning happens at home. Sometimes it's that conversation of, you know, you're not spending enough time with us. You're not focusing enough on your family. You're all distracted with your your hobbies or your work or your outside things. You need to think about the people that love you and need you to be present. And we don't want to hear that conversation, but it might be the most important thing that is told to us And it's told from love and a desire for things to go well. And then those conversations that you can have with friends when you get all worked up about something and you're starting to act foolish about it because you're too concentrated on that and it's affecting you too much. And your good friend, your loving friend, your friend that really cares about you says, wait a minute, you're getting a little out of balance here. Do you realize what effect and impact you're having on other people? And they're kind of like a mirror to you. And they tell you, you know, you need to think about what's going on and maybe drop something, maybe forgive something, maybe move on from something, maybe focus in a different direction. God's pruning is God's way of loving us and bringing out the best. And the point is, even in those times that we really don't want to hear the Spirit telling us these things, That's even more of a time to come back to Jesus, to make sure we abide in him, to spend time in the prayer, in the word, in the worship, in that connection, to continue to focus on him, to allow him to make us productive and spirit-filled and gifted and beautiful. You know, my little grandson's about four and a half, and his, his new saying is, I love you, you're beautiful. 
which, you know, he might say that when he wants to get away with something sometimes, do you? But he sent me a postcard, and he had his mom, he signed his name, and he had his mom dic dictated to her, Grandpa, I love you, you're beautiful. And I, I got it up on my mantle now, you know, I'm very proud of that. My first postcard from him. But, you know, that's how God feels about you. He loves you, and he thinks you're beautiful, and he wants to make you even more beautiful. And you become more loving and lovable and more beautiful the more you abide in the true vine, the more you abide in Christ. So, folks, we are the original abiders. And we abide in the one who loved us enough to lay his life down for us, who puts us in the right direction, who makes sure we're equipped for the journey. He gives us the guidance that we need to stay on the right path and to focus on the right things and to become more and more fruitful and productive, to impact the lives of others. And one of the incredible things that you find as you, you impact the lives of others is that you get more blessing often than they do by being a force of good in their life, by being Jesus to them. We're beginning Hollywood, folks. This is a time to reflect upon what Jesus did for us. The depth of the love that he showed. As Paul says, he has proven his love for us and that while we were in rebellion against him, he died for us. And so I invite you to abide in him this week. This Friday, we're having Voices of the Passion from noon on, and that'll be an opportunity to come and to take your own time and work your way through the different displays and reflect upon the sacrifice that Christ made. At 6 p.m., we're going to have a worship service. We're going to focus upon Good Friday. And the fact that Jesus, after he told his disciples, no greater love has anyone than to lay down his life for his friends. In the garden, he does exactly that. He lays down his life that his friends may go free. He lays down his life that we may go free. It's, it can be a heavy time. It can be a time to really struggle and reflect upon that and think about those things that we don't always like to think about. But as tough as Friday can be, we know that Easter's on its way. We know that the power of God will not allow that grave to hold Jesus down. So spend some time this week reflecting upon the one who loves you, the great I am, the true vine, and abide in him. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for your incredible love. In all the ways that you show it, Lord, we ask that you would be at work in our life this holy week. We ask that we would be open to all that you have for us and that this would be an opportunity for us to receive the spiritual life that flows only from our Lord Jesus. That we might learn those things that we need to let go of and be reminded of those things that we need to embrace. And focus upon being the people you call us to be. Being the people you have given us the power to equip us to be. That Jesus Christ might be lifted high this holy week. That he might draw others to him. And that all of us might experience that little foretaste of the eternal life you have planned for us in Christ. For this we pray in his holy name. Amen.